Bravo, we got a roll program. Stand by for mode one, Charlie. Roger, tower. Launch sequence engaged, we are go. Today I want to talk about another one of those areas. It's something that all of us have fallen into at some point or another. It's something that it doesn't really even matter what you believe about God that you've done at some point or another. Because the reality is at some point on your faith journey, at some point on your faith journey, you're going to, you're going to settle into a bargaining posture with God. At some point on your faith journey, you're going to settle into a bargaining posture with God. And you already have. Again, I don't, I don't care who you are, where you've been, what you believe about God. All of us have done this. And you found yourself driving home late at night and you prayed and you said, God, God, if you will ensure that my parents are asleep when I get home, I promise you, I promise you, I will attend church every Sunday for the rest of the year. God, if you could just make sure that my boss is sick when I get to work tomorrow morning and I don't have to make that presentation, I promise you, and you have made some incredible promises to God. God, if you'll make sure, if you could just, God, if you please will make sure that she's not pregnant, I promise you, I will become a priest if you will just, please, if you will. Or maybe for some of you it's the opposite. And it was, God, if you will, if you would just please allow us to, to get pregnant, I promise you. But all of us, again, even if you're here today and you say, no, I'm an atheist, I guarantee you, you have already done this. And we fall into, we settle into a bargaining posture with God. God, if you'll just do this, just do this, then I will. And we make our promises. I remember one of the most significant times in my life when I did this. One of my, one of my best friends on my basketball team got into a car accident. And we learned that he was in a coma and only had about a 2% chance of surviving. And I remember being on the bus on our way back from a game and hearing of the accident. He was driving separately. And I remember praying and saying to God, because I had kind of wrestled with God for most of my life about whether or not God wanted me to do what I do today. And I remember saying, God, if you will just allow him to live, I'll become a pastor. All of us have done it. All of us have been there. We've settled into this bargaining posture with God about all sorts of different things. And there's, there's so much that's, that's crazy about this. But the amazing thing, the amazing thing is, is that sometimes, as was the case with my friend, sometimes God actually comes through. Sometimes your boss actually was sick the next day. Some, sometimes it actually worked out. But you know, but you know what I know about you and about me, not just that we've done this before, but then, but then we don't actually keep, we don't actually keep our end of the bargain. My friend Brent actually lived. And I came out of it and said, um, I, I mean, I don't know if you really work that way. I mean, do you really hold people to these things? I don't really know. It's amazing how, how 
We make these bargains with God and, and, and we negotiate with God and we say, I will, I will, I will. And, and you went to church for the next few weeks. Or maybe you, you gave some money to that organization. But, but it's amazing. We, we don't even keep our end of the bargain. And there's all sorts of really interesting assumptions that we make as we step into these bargaining negotiation conversations with God. One of the first assumptions, and I, and I know not many of us have, have actually thought through this, but this, but it, this is, if you look at it, this is absolutely true and very, it, it's a little crazy. It, the first assumption that we make is this. We assume, when you step into that conversation with God, you assume that God knows you exist. Do you understand how much faith it takes to have that bargaining conversation with God? You assume that God actually knows that you exist. You assume that God's actually listening to you that God can actually hear you. It takes incredible faith to have that conversation. You assume that God actually knows about your circumstances, that he's informed of your circumstances, that God can do something about your circumstances. It's an incredible assumption that we make when we begin to bargain with God. The second assumption is even, even crazier. Because the second assumption that we make is this, that you or that I have something that God wants. Not only do I assume that God knows about my circumstances, but now I'm assuming that, God has, that I have something that God actually wants or, that, or something that God needs. It takes incredible faith to be able to enter into these conversations, but all of us have had these conversations with God and we come to God and say, okay, God, this is what I want. And if you'll just do this. And it's amazing. Sometimes we're actually asking God to do something bad to someone else. Like if you could just make my boss sick tomorrow, that would be incredible. It's not, not too sick, just a little sick where he doesn't show up to work. That would be great. And we make, we make these assumptions and then we come back and assume that we have something that God wants. Because God, if you'll just do this, then, then I've, got some, I've got something for you. How about, how about some shiny obedience? I've got some obedience for you, God, and I'll obey you if you'll do this. Or, you know what, God? I, I'll give, to that, I'll give to that organization that I know you've been wanting me to give to you. I've got some money, God. Maybe I can buy you off. I've got something that you want. How about some church attendance? I'll throw in some church attendance as well. When you look at it for what it actually is, it's, it, it, you realize that, 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 that's crazy. But we make these assumptions, and all of us have done this, and all of us have been there. And we've made these assumptions that God knows that we exist and the, the assumption that in some way, shape, or form that God wants something that you have. Have you ever thought about what it's like to be God in these conversations? For years, I've been telling you, if you want to understand Scripture, you've got to put yourself in the story. You've got to put yourself in the story. You've got to put yourself in the story. And many of you have gotten better at this and you're beginning to experience a new scripture in a new way because you actually put yourself in the story. You think through, okay, what would it actually be like to be John in this moment? What would it be like to be Peter as he stepped out of that boat? What would it be like to be other disciples watching Peter walk on the water and realizing that you missed that moment? You, you understand what it's like to put yourself into the story. But, but for many of us, we still only put ourselves in the story from the perspective of the people in the story. If you're going to understand the fullness of the story, you need to understand, listen, listen very carefully. Every single story in Scripture has one consistent character. Every single one. There's not one story in Scripture that's missing him. And that character is God. And if you're going to understand the fullness of the story, you have to put yourself into the story, not just as the people in the story, but to actually think through and process, okay, what would it actually be like to be God watching this happen, to be God experiencing people talk to him that way or respond to him that way or treat him that way? What would it actually be like? What would that feel like? Now, let me ask you, let me ask you to do that in your own story. To think through that moment where you negotiated with God. And, and to think through, what would it be like to be God in that moment? As I thought through it, I thought about certain moments where my seven-year-old comes to negotiate with me. And so he says, well, you know, God, Dad, will you, will, will you let me do this? I, I, I really, I really want to do this. 
No, I, I don't think. I'll give you my $20. Really? The $20 I, I gave you last week? Yeah, I'll give you my $20, Dad. It's, it's a lot of money. I'll give you my... No. I actually think that my boys are smart enough to not use obedience in that negotiation. Dad, if you'll just let me do this, I'll obey you. No, you will obey me. <laughs> What's it like to be, to be God in that moment? God, if you'll just move heaven and earth... I'll go to church. All of us, all of us have done this. And all of us, all of us in some way, shape, or form, function, interact with God in this way. And one of the reasons why we do that is because this entire idea, this entire idea of negotiation, it's, it's the heartbeat of religion. It's the heartbeat of religion. And almost every religion comes to us and says, okay, here's the deal. This is a negotiation between you and God. There's gonna be a back and forth between you and God. And this is what God wants from you. And if you get this right, then God's gonna give you this. This isn't just true of modern day religions. This is true of almost every religion for all of time. The Romans used to say, God favors those who are prepared. If you're well prepared, then God's going to do this. Some of you are like, I thought that was a Bible verse. It's not actually in the Bible at all. It's, it's amazing how many times I'll, I'll hear people say, you know, God helps those who help themselves. And they'll say it to me like they're quoting scripture. And I'll say to them, you realize that's not a Bible verse, right? And they'll say, are you sure? I'm pretty sure. As a matter of fact, I'm completely positive. It's not in there. But we have this idea, and it's at the heart of religion. But, but, there's one faith tradition. There's one faith tradition that steps in and says, no, 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 no. That's not the way God works. And I love being able to walk people through this because, again, it's so common in the way that we think. As a matter of fact, some of you right now are thinking, wait, is there any other way? I thought this was what church was about. I thought this was the whole system. And your entire life, this is the way that you've interacted with God. Your entire life, this is the only thing that you've been told about God. But the reality is, is that Jesus steps onto the scene. Jesus steps onto the scene. And Jesus says, I want to tell you about the Father. And you need to understand this about the Father. God doesn't negotiate. God doesn't negotiate because, because God doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. The message of Jesus, and, and I, I believe, as hopefully you've seen as we've walked through Scripture over the past couple of weeks, the entire message of the Scripture is the reality that, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I know you think God works this way, but God works in a completely different way. And Jesus steps on and says, your father, you need to understand this about your father. Your father doesn't negotiate. Why? Because he doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. And as God steps into your life, he doesn't step into your life and say, oh, no, no, no. I, I want for you to provide this for me so that I will then give you this in return. No, as a matter of fact, one of the most famous verses in, in all of Scripture is, for God so loved the world that he gave. Jesus steps in and says, what I'm about to teach you, and this isn't something new, it existed from the time of Abraham. What, what I'm about to walk you through, what I want for you to be able to see about the Father is that this whole thing, it's not about a contract, it's not about a negotiation. No, no, no. This whole thing that God's doing, it's not about a back and forth. It's not about bargaining. No, 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 no. This is about a gift. 
The Christian faith is not based on the contractor negotiation model. It's based on the gift model. And I would say this, the message of Christ, the message of Scripture. And I say that for, that, for this reason. For some of you, you say, no, wait, 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 wait. I grew up inside of Christianity. In my entire life, I was taught the bargaining model. My entire life, I was taught if I wanted God to do this for me, I needed to do this for God. And if I did this right, if I said the right prayers, if I went the right a number of times, if I, if I got it right, then God would love me. Then God would do this for me. Then God would bless me. And the reality is, is that there's a lot of people who claim to represent the message of Christ, who take the instructions of God, which as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, are not a condition of his love, but confirmation of his love. But they take those instructions and they turn those into conditional statements. And maybe you've been taught that, but make no mistake about it, that's not what the scriptures teach. And that's not what Jesus taught those who followed him. He said, no, 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 you need to understand. You need to understand. The father doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. The term that we use to talk about this is the term grace. Maybe you've heard it before. We're kind of big on it here at Hoboken, grace. As a matter of fact, it's our number one core value. It drives everything that we do. The definition, the easiest definition to remember of for grace is this idea, unmerited favor. Now, grace is more than mercy. Sometimes we interact with grace like it's mercy. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. And so I deserve this punishment, but you don't get that punishment. That's mercy. Grace is when not only do you not get what you deserve, but you get something positive on top of it. You get something completely undeserved in addition to it. Unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. And God has consistently, not just with Jesus, but God has consistently, and Jesus steps on and is consistently referencing back to the reality that, no, 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 the Father has always, that this is the way that the Father engages us. It's through grace. It's through grace. One of, one of, the, one of the passages that captures this the best is actually found in the book of Ephesians. Now, Ephesians is written by a guy named Paul. Some of you know his story. He wasn't originally named Paul. He was originally named Saul, and he despised Christianity. He despised Jesus Christ. He wanted to do everything that he could. As a matter of fact, no one did more at the launch of the church to destroy the church than Saul. But then God stepped into his life and changed everything, stepped into his life and rescued him. And then he uses, he uses Paul to take the message of Jesus to more of the Roman Empire than anyone else, to plant more churches at the beginning of the church than anyone else, and to write a huge portion of what is the Christian scriptures. Let, let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought through why God chose Paul? So, some of you... Some of you know a little bit of Paul's story. You say, well, Paul was, he was, he was aggressive. He was assertive. But, but here's the thing. I guarantee you there were other people that had ambition. I guarantee you there were other people that were aggressive and assertive. So why did God choose Paul? Why is Paul the one that God uses in such a drastic way to be able to communicate this message? Listen, listen to what Paul writes as he writes to the church at Ephesus. I think, it, I think it answers the question. It starts off, and as he starts off, I'll give you just a disclaimer. He's not very positive at the beginning. It's not very encouraging. Listen, listen to what he says as he starts off. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, As for you, you were dead in your trans transgressions and sins. Now, dead here is not talking about physically dead. Well, as you read through the scriptures and you experience the idea of death, more often than not, it's talking about spiritual death. In other words, you're disconnected from God. God was dead to you and you were dead to him. You're completely disconnected from God. It's talking about spiritual death. Why? Because we're not just mistakers. He says, here's the reality of your condition. You were completely alone spiritually. And then he continues 
What he continues with is incredibly important because as he describes our condition, he says, he says something that's in- incredibly powerful. L- l- listen to what he says. He says, but God. Now don't miss this because he doesn't say, but you. You were dead in your tra- transgressions and sins, but you. No, no, no. But God. We had no way of saving ourselves. But God, being rich in mercy, in other words, in other words, having mercy to spare, abounding in mercy. Let me ask you something. Do you think of God this way? Do you think of God this way? One of, my, one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament of the Jewish scriptures is about an individual who had a relationship with God, and God comes to him and says, I want for you to take my message to this city. The city was called Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a terrible place, an evil place, a place that had done really, really bad things to, to the people of, uh, of this person's, in, in this person's life. And so God says, I want for you to take this message to this city because I'm about to bring judgment on them. And and this individual looks back at God and says, I'm not going to do it because here's what I know about you. And I love this phrase because he looks back at God and he says, I'm not going to do it because here's what I know about you. You are rich in mercy. And I know what you're going to do. If they turn back to you, you're going to forgive them. And I don't want you to forgive them. I love that story because it challenges me every time. Do I actually see God this way? He says, but God, but God, being rich in mercy, quick to forgive, wanting to forgive, looking to forgive, being rich in mercy. And then he continues Because of his great love with which he loved us, and this is so important, but God being rich in mercy because of what? Because of your great church attendance. Because of your promises. No. What is the why that drives the whole story? What's the why? Because of his great love with which he loved us. What drives the whole thing? His great love. This is so important, and I want for you to be able to, to, to take hold of this. I'm just going to change it just a bit. Because of his great love with which he loved me. I want you, right now, I want, I want for you to read that with me. Ready? Because of his great love with which he loved me. Why? Because of how he loves you. Because of his great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ, Even when we were dead in transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. He brought us back. He reconnected us with the Father. Why? Because of his great love. He reconnected us. And then then I love this statement. Even when we were dead in transgressions. You know who understood that really well? Paul. Paul. Because in the midst of Paul pursuing the Christians that he would put to death, in the midst of him pursuing the church that he wanted to destroy, God stepped in and rescued him. Why? Because Paul had turned it around? Why? Because Paul had had actually repented? No, because of God's incredible love for him, even in the midst of his sin, in the midst of him working to destroy what God was doing. God stepped in and rescued him. Why did God choose Paul? 
I believe it's because God wanted the person to communicate the message just as much as the message itself. And so who am I going to use? I'm going to use the one who hated me the most. That's who I'm going to use. Just in case, just in case someone thinks, just in case someone thinks that it's about what they've done, just in case someone thinks that they're too far gone, I'm going to use the one who hated me the most, who opposed me the most. Why? Because I want to make sure that even the person captures the power of the message and what it is that I'm actually about. The interesting thing is that Paul walks them through this. And then he goes on, and for the next couple of verses, he kind of breaks that down a little bit and begins to to tease out some ideas. But it seems like he gets a couple of verses further and he realizes, wait, I don't know that I captured that exactly the way that I wanted to capture it. I want to make sure, wait, we got to go back to that because I want to make sure they don't miss this. And so in verse 8, he jumps back to it. Listen to what it is that he says in verse 8. He says, it is by grace that you have been saved. Just in case you missed it in those earlier verses. Let me go back to this. It is by grace that you have been saved. Through faith. Well, we've heard this before, haven't we? I don't need you to clean up the mess. I just need you to trust me. Israel, before we even get to the instructions, before we even get to the instructions, I want you to know the relationship that we have. I want you to know the relationship that I have with you. Well, what was that relationship built on? What was it that that relationship was based on? Well, you trusted me. Abraham was declared righteous because of what? He trusted me. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is what? It's a gift. He says, and this is not of you. You know, you didn't you didn't do this, you didn't make this happen. There was no, there's no part that you played in making this a reality. There was no negotiation. There was, there was nothing that you brought into this that made this a reality. So, no, no, it is a gift. You have to understand something. God has extended to you a gift. You can either receive that gift or you can reject it. But understand this. This is not something that you earn. No, it is a gift. Just in case there's any question about that, he continues. He says, not by works. It's a gift, not by works, so that no one can boast. Listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. A proud Christian is at best misinformed and at worst not a Christian at all. Why? Because Paul steps in and says, no, 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 no. No one earns their way back. No one negotiates their way back in. No one bargains their way back. It's not of works. None of us get to boast. No one gets to look around the room and say, no, I earned my way back in. No. It's by... Grace. 